also have three founding members, John Colwell Linfield, who provided the land, Robert Williams Armstrong, who was the architect of the older part of the building, and David McBurney, who was a wealthy merchant from Dublin, and he provided the finance. And then just to my left here, we have passed through the museum. That museum is self-guided, so if you've time your way back after this tour, please feel free to take a look around the museum. We have loads of pieces in there, some of them dating back to the 1800s, and you can read up on those pieces using the little cards in each hand. Okay. Now, just before taking into the factory, this is a working factory, so I just appreciate that if you did not touch or handle any of the wear, because all of the pieces are in really delicate condition, and they will be sitting out on the craftspeople's desks and trolleys all around your drive. So please don't touch anything in any department. If you have any mobile phones, would you mind turning them off and putting them on silent for me? And if you have any cameras today, please feel free to take photographs throughout the tour. The only thing I would ask, if you wouldn't mind turning the flash off in your camera whenever you're around the craftspeople, just because some of them are sensitive to the flash. And in the unlikely event of a fire, I will leave a camera on the okay. So, this is our mold making department, so we'll just make the moulds along these desks here. Now, to start off making the belief, it is after any design is approved, a working drawing is made, and this is done by our design team upstairs. Now, this is a sketch of the Rose Isle Pansy Vase, which is a new visitor centre exclusive to Belake this year. So, this is the only place in the world that you'll be able to see or purchase this particular item. And today on the tour, I'm just going to show you how it's made from start to finish. So, it is from this sketch that our craftspeople will then make a model. And the ingredients for this model are plaster, clay, and water. And this little model can actually take up to a couple of weeks to make, and that's because of the designs on it. These designs are all hand carved, and it just takes so long because it's such a meticulous process, and as you can see yourselves, so much detail goes into it. Now, it is from the model that we will then make a master mold, which is made from plaster of Paris. So you can just see the designs taken from the model into the mold here. And these master molds are always retained and stored. So we would have master molds here in the factory dating back to the early 1860s. It is from the master mold that they will then make a case mold. And these case molds can make up to 200 working molds. But for some of the more popular pieces, they would use a rubber case mold, which can make up to 10,000 working molds. And it's in the parian department where I'm taking you next. I will show you these working molds and what actually goes into them to make the pieces of bacon. Okay, so you can follow them this way now. Okay. So these are the working molds that you see all around you here now. And these molds are used mm -hmm. once a day, five days a week. And a mold is a lifespan of about eight weeks altogether. But after the eight weeks, the design inside the mold will begin to fade, and then the mold has to be destroyed. So one mold here can make about roughly 40 pieces of china altogether. <coughs> and what goes into the molds? This is called the casting slip, and it is just poured into every mold like this. And the ingredients for the casting slip are potash and water. Feldspar imported from Norway, and the china clay now comes from Cornwall. And that casting slip is piped directly to each person's desk through these yellow pipes you see running the whole way along here. And a craftsperson will usually fill about 12 to 18 moulds at one time, just along their desks here. And by the time they get to their last mould, the first one that they fill should be ready for emptying. So they will just empty out the slip. Just see yourselves, the excess bit of slip, which is left around the edges there, that's what makes your pieces of bling. Now, so they would leave it in for a little bit longer than I just did, and the longer you leave it in for, the thicker your pieces will be. Now that slip is then left dry in the mold like this for about two to three hours, where it will take to the designs. And then once it's taken out of these molds, it's at the greenware stage. And it's at the greenware stage, say on teapots and certain mugs, when the spikes and the handles can be attached. Your pieces are then left dry for about another 24 hours, where they will naturally dry and come to the white horse stage. And it is at the white horse stage that the craftspeople here will carry out the fettling process. And fettling will be the removal of any excess clay, rough edges, and seams to the pieces from whenever they come out of these moulds. And then the tools that they use for doing this, I'm just going to take you down to PJ here, you'll see them in front of him. Okay, so these turtles here 
are square hair brushes, sharp knives, sponges and some water. And those would have been the same tools that were used many years ago as well. Now all of these pieces here, they are at the whiteware stage. This is after 24 hours of drying. So I'll pass around a little bit of whiteware there. I'll break up some of it. So that's what these pieces would feel like, PJ's working with. And at this stage you don't want to go up too hard or use too much water as the designs would fade. And if you were to put the white wear in water for too long, it would dissolve. We also have some green wear. So this would be after about two to three hours of drying. So we can just say it's a little bit darker in colour. A bit more flexible. It's at the green wear stage, say, on teapots and certain mugs, when you would attach the handles and the spouts, just because it's softer. And you would use some excess slip with some table salt added to it to make it like a thicker paste, to stick the pieces together. You would also have these wooden boards in front of them with just some water on it and it's used to smooth and level off the tops of pieces because whenever they come out of the moulds they have an excess bit of waste on the top of them which they can either cut off at the green wear stage with a sharp knife or lift off the white wear stage. Why is that These are at the green wear stage, just the PJ with the board. I'm just wondering why it's tilted. No, it's just the way you put it. Oh, There's a reason why it's tilted. Just the person here, I'll be moving point. that shortly, you know. Oh, okay. I just cut them there. I thought there was a trick to it. Oh, tilt it and it comes <laughs> out better. I know, I know. I'll just uh, I move those. You've only got a couple of hours to cut the pieces once you take them out of the mold. If you let them get too dry, you know, they get too hard and you can't cut them. You have to be nice and flexible. How many would you do in a day? It would depend. Uh, on these bases, you would probably make about 80 pieces. If you're making something with about four parts, you might only do 20 to 30, you know. Uh, the little pig there, the ears and the, and the legs are separately, you know. So they're much slower. It just really depends how many parts are in the piece. Again, you do that while they're soft and dark and coloured, you know. You touch them and then you let them dry overnight and then you can finish them off then, you know. What about the curly tail? Oh yes, that's all part of it. Uh, you would actually trace in the, the design if you would put a seam on mm -hmm. over design. You would trace it back in again. Use these tools here, you know. You work on the same pieces day after day. I know we would generally for about eight weeks. At that stage, then that pattern will fade, and we'll get something different to make. But you make a selection of different pieces, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you make those vases and these here, and the pigs, and the other type of vases down there as well. You know, the wee castles and piggy bags. You get a good variety. Would you say that every piece is identical? I know, there's a slight variation in them because I would have cut all those by hand. Yeah. You know, so uh, there is a slight difference in some of them, you know. And so sort of form them in as to whether they're cut good or not. <laughs> And in this department you would have an apprenticeship for two to three years and all your training is done on site by a master craftsman. And once they finish their pieces they also carve a little letter into the bottom of the piece. It's just a random letter given to all of the craftspeople and it's for quality control purposes. They're on a two-week holiday. Usually a bit we're not allowed any holidays. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still do the tours when it's fully up and running? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, we do tours on Saturdays as well. You know, we stagger. I get my holidays later on, and, and we have people in on Saturdays to cover it as well for tours. You know. How long have you worked here, Patrick? Forty years. Wow. Just getting the hang of it Just now. Just getting. <laughs> so you've passed your apprenticeship. I think so, yeah. 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 <laughs> so why aren't you on holiday? Yeah. I, I just take mine later on, you know. You're in the off season. Especially for I you. am. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get to September, you know, and go then. Here. And the gum arabic just makes the clay more grey in colour, as you can see, and more pliable to work with. And when they're working with their clay in this department, it looks like this. And how they get looking like this is through the dot box, which is just that red machine over there. The clay will be extruded through the dot box in these long spaghetti-like strands. And it is these strands that are used for weaving the bases of your baskets and to get the designs all around the baskets as well. So first of all, for your base, two, three or four strands will be placed on a ceramic tile. 
and then your base is hand woven on that tile. And just to get it looking like this, they have these little templates here which they cut around. So it just means your baskets can be any shape or size. It's just a few examples here of what your bases can look like. That base is then placed on top of a block mould which has the same shape as the base. And then those long strands are placed diagonally in different directions on top of each other, whole way around the block mould. And this is what gets your designs around the basket. So you can just see one half done here for the time being. And then once it's been left dry, they can lift it off and you have the basket. Now it's the same with the flowers in this department. They are all handcrafted on the palm of people's hands. And they can range from simple little flowers like this one, just a couple of petals to it, compared to say one like this, which might have up to about 50 or 60 on it. So you can just appreciate the amount of work that goes in here. The only tools they would use in this department, this is the 5 inch nail, which is flattened and smoothed at either end. They would also use the pin and the old razor blade, and again it's the same tools from many years ago. The only mould used in this department is the leaf mould, so they just place a little bit of clay in that design there, and you can just see a few little leaves around this basket, that's what they look like. Also the little white tile that goes in the bottoms of the basket, that is for the craftsperson's initial to go on the bottom and also for the trademark stamp to be fused to the bottom in the next department. And our craftspeople here would also keep a little pot of olive oil on their desks and they just rub some of the olive oil on the palm of their hands and it's to stop the clay from sticking to their hands. They also really soft hands at the end of the day which is good bonus. So, I'm going to take is, you to some is, of the Is there a plus minus number of those that they use or is it just arbitrary? Which? Well, the, the numbers, because I know. Oh, no, 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 it's all done by eye. Now, you have a standard to follow, okay. um, so you have to follow the standard, but, you know, as they are all made by hand, you'll never get anyone to exactly the no, I, I know that, and that's yeah. why I was wondering. And there's no markers for where to put these strands here. Okay. It's all done by eye as well. You can see, actually, some of our girls making them here today. I'll tell you about one of them. And it's just a couple of strands rolled in different directions. And what's, what she's using to attach those is just some excess clay that is watered down. It's just in that little bowl there. So that's as their clay substance. How long is the apprenticeship in? In this department, it's three to five years, and training's done on site again by a master craftsman. Okay. So it's different in each department. And it doesn't matter how long you've been in any of the departments, if you want to change, you have to do the apprenticeship. Wow. Because it's completely different skills, as you can see. And how do you. <coughs> Or well, you would have a trial period, a six-week trial period, roughly, and then you pass a trial period, you can start your apprenticeship then. So how long is that period? The six-week trial, and then oh, your apprenticeship then, whatever department so you're in. So you make it in six weeks or they yeah. don't? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, they can put you to another department to see you. And are they usually potters coming into that six-week training, or they've got no experience at all? It doesn't, it just depends. Okay. Most of the people on the previous year, they came straight from school, you know, PJ's been there 40 years, so... Are they paid hourly or by the piece or what? He's worked and then it's an hourly rate in here. Are they paid well? I can't discuss that. No, I don't. Yeah. Sorry. Whatever they're paid, they're underpaid. Yeah. yeah. Quite a car. Wow. And do people, most people stay a long time, I'd say? Well, I heard PJ there. 40 so years. 40 years. Oh, yeah. I'll say most people stay yeah. a long time. Yeah, usually. And most people that work here live within a 20 mile radius. <laughs> so, I'll take you over to the office desk. So, you somebody who makes specifically the flowers, makes specifically no, they're everything. everything. 
So and the it's, there's a certain number of placement of the flowers on the basket. Yeah, you can stop and follow him. Any other questions? Who develops the standards? We have a design team and then our crafts people have some input as well. Do they? Yeah, that's good. Since I have to deal with it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so take it just down here to take it. Yep, and we also have a slight color change as well. Yeah. Now there's just a uniform shrinkage of 14% and that is due to water evaporation in the kiln. This stage here is known as the biscuit whip stage and quality inspection will be carried out here as well just to make sure that nothing happened to the little bees while it was in the kiln. And if it passes quality control at this stage, it's now ready to be hand dipped in the glaze here. And the ingredients for the glaze are borax and frit. Borax is a mineral and frit is a finely ground glass which will just give you pieces of the lake that creamy gloss finish which is what it is world renowned for. So these would just be some of our little Christmas hanging ornaments or Irish hanging ornaments before they've been dipped in the glaze. Can I get one volunteer to come up and dip a piece in for me? Huh? You dip it in for me and then leave it here to dry. Show everybody the masterpiece and I can see you right Thank you so much. And so once your pieces have been dipped in the glaze, they go for a second firing. The second firing is for 10 hours and 1,000 degrees. Only the glaze will be removed from the bottom of the piece here, and that's just to stop it from sticking in the kiln. And then once it comes out of that second firing, now at this stage, it's ready to be hand painted, and also for the trademark stamp to be fused to the bottom, which I'll show you now in the next department. Okay, so we're just going to head straight through here. So these are all of the paints here, they're kept on separate ceramic tiles, they don't mix the colours. 
And when they're painting their pieces, it's usually one colour used at a time. So they will go over all the pieces that they have with the first colour, then they move on to the next colour and go back over all the pieces. But for the majority of the pieces, the designs are already on them. That's for mould making, so you just have to paint over these little shamrocks. But again, there are pieces that they have to do hand for this way. You would also have gold, mother of pearl and platinum paints in here, just in those little dishes there. And when they're painted on, they're a certain colour, but once they're fired, they'll actually change colour completely. So take your gold, for example, it would be like a dark red when it's painted on, and then once it's fired, it will fire up gold. Is this all white paint? It's powdered mineral paint. What? The little powders, the little powder I showed, it's just powdered mineral paint. Oh, that's almost um, the Oh, really? Right. Is this the only place she said white? No, no, it's the only place that's quite chalky. And they're also starting to come off there. And that's just from ourselves touching it the past couple of months. So it must go in the kiln for a third and final firing. And the last firing is for seven hours at 700 degrees centigrade. And when your vase comes out of that last firing, this is the difference. So your colours become much more vibrant, yeah. glossier. They're now permanent to the piece. As is the trademark stamp and the painter's quality control letter there on the bottom. Now this little base here takes about roughly 10 days to make, but it goes through 16 pairs of hands just to get to this stage here. So that's every department that I brought you through today, they have all contributed in some way to making this tiny little base. It's a visitor centre exclusive, along with the rose-eyed pansy base and some of our baskets here. So down here at the visitor centre, it's the only place in the world that you to see or purchase these particular items. They won't be online in any catalogues, just here. And then this is the traditional trademark stamp, but the Balik Living one, you'll see it as you're walking out here in one moment, it's on the left hand side of the wall. It consists of a harp in the middle and writing all around it saying Balik Living. So please don't be alarmed if you buy a piece today and it doesn't have the dog or the tire on it. It's going to have the other trademark stamp, but it still means it's genuine Balik. It's just a new contemporary range from 2003. And then 65% of our wear is exported to the US and Canada, and the remaining 35% goes to the UK, Ireland, and the rest of the world. Okay? So folks, that is the end of our tour today. Thank you so much for coming around with me. Just want to take you out through these doors now. The museum is going to be directly to your right this time. The tea rooms are around to the left of the reception desk if anybody needs any refreshments, and our gift shop is straight ahead to the left.